Hello and welcome everyone to this past marathon analytics. We are excited you could join us today for Thomas' session, Common Data Science Mistakes. This past marathon features back-to-back -back live webinars delivered by expert speakers from the past community. The sessions will be recorded and posted online after the event. You will receive an email letting you know when the recordings are available. My name is Christian Henrik Reich, and I'm a cloud consultant working for the company Cloudion. I have a few introductory slides before I hand over the reads to Thomas. <clears throat> if you require technical assistance, please uh, use the question pane located on the right side of your screen and someone will assist you. This question pane is also where you may ask any question. Feel free to enter your questions at any time, and once we get to the Q&A portion of the sessions, I'll read your questions aloud to the speaker. You are able to zoom on the presentation's content by using the Zoom button located on the top of your presentation window. Please note that there will be a short evaluation at the end of the session. This will pop up after the webinar ends in your web browser. Your feedback is really important to us for future events, so please take a moment to complete it. And I just have to uh, move some slides. Uh, Thomas, next and uh, next. And one more, please. Cool. I will. Um, I will. Uh, give a big thanks to our presenting sponsor, uh, Quest. This past marathon wouldn't be possible without their support. If you would like to learn more about them and their solution, please visit the sponsor page and the past marathon website. And <clears throat> keep learning all year long. Visit past.org and check out all the free educational resources available to past members. Connect, share and learn. Next. This uh, past marathon session is presented by Thomas. Thomas is a BI developer and data analysis. His main focus are data mining, SQL development, programming, and query optimization. He has been working with SQL Server since version 2000. He's a Microsoft certified professional and a Microsoft MVP for data platform and a Microsoft trainer. So without further ado, Here's Thomas with common data science mistakes. Here you go, Thomas. Thank you, Christian Henrik, and thanks for past marathon for having me. So um, good morning, everybody who's in Europe. Good afternoon and good evening to the rest of the parts of the world. Um, I don't know where you're coming from, but um, thank you for um, being with us today, tonight. So today um, we'll talk about common data science mistakes. Um, and first of all, thanks Christian for a beautiful introduction. I would like to point out that I am not a data scientist because data scientists own a MacBook. So you can see my laptop, but I don't own a MacBook. Um, our statisticians, which I am and live in San Francisco. So I am from Slovenia. I guess I do not fit this definition of who data scientist is. Uh, by the way, this was taken a couple of years ago from a Twitter where people started discussing who really a data scientist is. And who the data scientist is, is actually a good depiction infographics of modern data scientists or statistician. So this is a person who needs to have both math and statistical backgrounds in order to do any kind of modeling, complex design, solutioning, and stuff like that. Um, needs to have programming or database knowledge regarding of SQL, NoSQL, R, Python. Um, domain knowledge is very important as well as soft skills, learning and knowing how the business works, how to 
converse with people, how to get what customer needs and stuff like that. And at the end, communication and visualization skills, which is also important in order to have the storytelling skills and how to translate the data-driven insights into decision actions. And of course, how to visualize the data. So the agenda for today will be kind of short, but still um, important in terms of where I've seen people will and had um, in the past made some mistakes. So first of all, I'll talk about soft skills, then selecting what is the appropriate tool. Gathering data and, genera and generating general statistics is also a very important part. Analyzing and predicting, and for the last part, I've selected visualization, which should be sort of like a fun part. But let's dig into the soft skills. The soft skills is usually um, one of the major component. Um, if you remember the infographics we've seen before, um, is where you need to know what your business and your client wants. Um, you definitely need to know what is your knowledge and what is your domain knowledge in order to give either the right tools or find either the, the correct or right person. Focus on the problem and not the tools. I've seen that many, many times that companies are focusing more on tool selection rather than problem solving. Create a plan, have a clear clear goal. And one for the last one is definitely don't overcomplicate. And of course, don't oversimplify. Both will definitely not produce a good or quick or quality result. Focusing on soft skills, um, I said that um, having a great plan and focusing on problem is a um, very important task. And you can see from left versus right hand side, um, which is who. Um, I've seen people saying, yeah, do some prediction for sales or something, actually saying very unstructured, very vague form um, need for the client versus where the people say very strict sort of describing the data source which you can see um, in this example table explaining what your um, input variables are what is your dependent or independent variable depending really on the algorithm you're choosing and most of all and most importantly defining your output if you define the output correctly you will definitely have um, much higher chances of um, succeeding in terms of time, in terms of money, and in terms of result. If you do not define the output, you will definitely have you know, people doing something at the end, delivering many different results, but m probably none of them will suit your need. So I can say that focusing on problem, creating a plan will definitely give you a much better solution but one of those quotes that keeps popping in my head was, <laughs> if, you fail to, uh, if you fail to plan, you're going to plan to fail. So stick to that as well. Um, selecting tools, um, nothing over the time has literally changed, um, only the terms. So if you go back from the 90s, um, we've used to talk about statistics between 1995 to 2010 data mining emerged and then in the past seven eight nine years all of a sudden data science emerged all those terms basically will definitely focus and have the same algorithms in behind as you can see regression tree decision tree clustering complexity reduction knife bias and stuff like that all those will have the same literally the same algorithms, but just the terms had changed over the time. Speaking of terms that have changed over the time, interfaces have changed as well. So going back to the 90s, I still can remember writing the code, not really on this punch card, but this is more of a joke. Um, but again, um, writing the code in any of those programs capable of doing statistical analysis on relatively smaller data sets as we've known them today. And then switching slowly into the mid 90s, 2000, 2010, all of a sudden graphical user interfaces have appeared, which means that um, people were literally you know, fed up with writing the code. They preferred 
um, clicking and pointing and dragging and dropping and getting the results much faster. With the emergence of data science years ago, so seven, eight, nine years ago, all of a sudden writing the code became again very popular. So the full circle <laughs> is closed or history repeats itself. So all of a sudden now people are not that much into um, drag and drop and um, GUI interfaces rather than they prefer write the code. But then pointing out, um, it really depends on what kind of person you are and um, what you're looking for. If you look into the Gartner quadrant um, for the data science, you will see that um, a lot of competitors um, actually give you the ability either to write the code or if you prefer everything out of the box um, then you will just basically drag and drop so um, something that comes up all the time in my head is for instance um, azure machine learning studio where you just simply drag and drop um, and create the flow or if you remember um, any kind of older um, data science or data mining tools had um, the same idea behind. So gathering data, the second part is also very important. Um, once we have the, the, the discussion with the customer, we start digging into the data. Um, so first of all, we need to know what kind of tool we will dealing with. Um, so don't lose precious time defining which tool is better. Um, you might as well do everything in Transact SQL. You might do as well everything in Python or in R. So focusing on that is just a waste of energy and time. Um, once you are, let's say, um, the weapon of choice, both R and Python, um, really depends on your flavor. Um, keep in mind that um, when merging different data sets from R and Python, um, order of those data frames is very important. Um, and then once we have some data together, we want to have some univariate statistics and those are as well very important and I've seen in the past people just ignoring the differences between statistical tests. What is the difference between Pearson, Candle, Spearman test. Nobody really knows, but then they just sort of doing it. Um, and of course, ignoring the distributions. Um, this is again, one thing that is very important when coming to um, the data science um, area that you have to know how your data is being distributed and what is the scarcity or the variance of your data sets. Um, and general statistics. General statistics is also very important. Um, people still, I can say, and I've seen many times that people are still um, cannot tell the difference between the different data types or the different variables. So um, why am I pointing this out? Because a lot of um, potential algorithms for data prediction and machine learning have um, those Y or dependent um, variable um, very important because um, based on the type of this variable, also the, the prediction model and the prediction algorithm will be dependent upon. Um, and of course, um, difference between causation and correlation, how to do and what to do with outliers and treating the null values. So I'll just quickly jump into the demo now, but I want to stick with this um, funny UK map. If you're asking yourself, what is this? Um, this was taken from the website. You can see the URL um, and I wanted to express the difference between correlation and causation. On both maps, you can see that somehow one is actually color and the other one is black and white, but you can see um, what was the comparison and correlation, let's say, uh, between Brexit and Medcow disease. So on left-hand side, you can see which counties in UK have voted for the Brexit. And on the right-hand side, you can see which areas were um, affected. Um, with Medcow disease. And you can immediately see that the correlation between both maps is literally one, which means that they are highly, highly correlated. 
but can you then assume that um, counties that have voted uh, Brexit or that counties that have met disease have also voted Brexit or vice versa? Or can we then come to the conclusion that <laughs> pet cow disease have um, issued or triggered the Brexit. So this is the difference between correlation and causation. Whereas the causation literally means that something is causing something. And I'm kind of sure that we cannot say that mad cow disease caused the Brexit, uh, even though they are highly correlated. So I'll switch first of all to my um, RStudio. So in our studio, we will take a look into those um, different data types. So um, in R or in Python, you definitely have to have um, different data types in order to deal with um, different algorithms. Um, but one of the most important thing is definitely um, having um, Factors. Factor is important because uh, you want to have your um, y variable or predicting variable defined as factor. Otherwise, um, you will definitely not have the right results or the, the code will fail. So I will just create a quick uh, vector of gender, male and female. And you can see that, first of all, my data set is called as a character um, length 50, male and female. And if I would go into any kind of uh, predicting algorithm with that, um, it will fail uh, unless I put it in a factor. And now you can see that my factor has two levels um, with different variables. Um, we've also mentioned the differences between uh, statistical tests. So I'll just create a sample data set here. So you can see a sample data set with cars um, and their um, corresponding variables or attributes. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to create a correlation matrix um, and then calculate, first of all, on one hand, personal correlation coefficient, Candle and Spearman. And I will be using WT and MPG. And you can see that WT right here at the bottom I will be using MPG and WT, and you can see that those are interval data types, which means that Pearson correlation coefficient would be the best one to have selected in this case. So first of all, I'll just create and run this one, and you can see that I get in case of Pearson minus 0.86. <clears throat> if I run candle, you see I get a different result still pointing that there is a high highly negative um, correlation but the number itself is different and then if I run the experiment again you can see that uh, my coefficient is again different so not knowing that um, definitely will have a effect on your um, data results if you don't know what kind of data type you are and which test is suitable for your data set. So remember 0.86 versus 0.72 versus 0.88. It might in this case not have any difference, but in the future if you're literally looking for those um, thresholds where the data will still be um, um, correspond if or not, then this might really have a huge effect. Um, again, causation and correlation. <laughs> I've created a sample data set here and I'll take a who likes sugar and I'll take weight and I'll create a data frame out of that and calculate the correlation. So I can see that since I've deliberately created this data set, I can see that there is a correlation between somebody who likes sugar and the weight. So we can say that the more the person weight, um, there is highly um, likely that this person will have um, like sugar. But what if this is everything fine, but we are looking for something third that might influence that. So in this case, I will introduce, let's say, the variable pregnancy. I'll add it to um, my data frame and create again the correlations. And now I can see that um, 
liking sugar still correlates with weight, but this is something which does not really say or causes um, likes. So liking sugar does not cause higher weight. The problem is that I have a third variable which is actually explaining this causality and not correlation, which is pregnancy. Um, saying that, you know, somebody who's pregnant is highly likely to have a higher body mass or body weight versus somebody who's not, but this not, not mean that um, this person who's um, more weighted does also like or that dislike sugar. But God forbid, no, um, one should not come to a conclusion that sugar causes pregnancy or something. Um, so this is the difference between correlation and causation in a five-minute um, explanation. Um, we said also something about outliers, um, so I'll just pull out some data set and create a quick um, plot. Um, so in this case, I'm just having a normal plot with my um, red dots depicting my data sets. And then what I'll do is, um, oops, I'll just run, uh, no, this is not, um, rerun that again, sorry. Okay. Um, so first of all, um, what happens when we forget to remove outliers? On the left-hand side, you can see that um, the red dot, dots represent my data set and the blue line sort of depicts the prediction. On the right hand side you can see in this corner um, that there are a couple of outliers whereas on the right hand side those outliers have been removed and you can see how much the prediction might change. So in this case um, if you're dealing with speed and distance of some cars you question yourself whether these are really outliers or not. Um, the best thing to do is to use your domain knowledge or go to business and ask them, is there really a car capable of speed of 20 miles and doing the distance of 200 miles? And of course, a common sense business person will tell you that this is either a mistake or really an outlier or somebody from the Mars. <laughs> and um, you immediately go and delete the those outliers and the prediction will definitely have um, and this will definitely have a huge impact on prediction and now you can see if on the left hand side if a new data set comes in with a speed of 20 um, my average distance predicted distance would be around 150 whereas once I've removed the outliers if I go with the new data set doing the speed of 20 my predicted distance would be around 60 so this is having a huge impact on outliers and therefore also um, on the predictions. So keeping in mind that removing the outliers is of course um, very important stuff, but what if I have much more data sets that I want to have um, removed? So in this case I'll just quickly jump and um, create a sort of a multivariate search for um, outliers. And in this case, I'm taking the data set, which is available right here online. Um, and I'm taking the um, ozone readings and creating um, across the months. And you can see that this is a very natural pattern, but I don't see at this point any any outliers. Those might not be significant, so I'll taking um, away um, the months and I'm putting in the weeks and you can still see that there's not really any significant differences or anything that can be understood. So what I'll do is I'll create a multivariate approach using the Cook distance. So in this case, um, once I do that, I'll just plot that and you can immediately see much easier and much faster which are the outliers. So you can see that Cook's distance based on those index formula that we've created, you can see those are the outliers. So number nine, sorry, the observation number nine, observation number eight, and so on and so forth. And down at the bottom, you can still see those periodical 
data sets that we've seen either through the week or through the months. And those sometimes, of course, can be hidden in those patterns, but there might be some data points that really sort of um, spikes out. So be aware of those as well. Um, those will definitely give you a hard time um, when coming to your um, interpretations and stuff like that. So going back to the slides, um, we've taken the look into the different types of correlations, um, what to do with outliers, um, different data types. Uh, please know that since this session will be 45 minutes long, um, I will not have the time to cover everything. So I'll just slowly go through a um, couple of those examples. The next thing is, um, things that we inadvertently forget about. Um, imagine distance algorithms, distance-based algorithms. Those are very prone to um, type of data that we put in. And if we forget to normalize them, then covariances between, between different data types and different lengths of those data types will cause inadvertent differences in the end result. Um, I always ask myself, do all the variables, input variables, needs to be correlated. Um, yes and no, really depends on the type of the um, problem you're solving. Um, for instance, knife bears by default, as this, it, this name suggests, um, naive because it sort of naively assumes that there is no um, there is no correlation between the in input variables and also other, but there are again, for instance, if you take into consideration factor analysis, there should be um, mediocre to high um, um, correlation between input variables. And uh, forgetting about data samples, data samples is also something very important when you're um, learning and constructing the model, always take um, different sa sets of data um, for constructing your model. This is also something which I've seen um, many, many times that people forget, sorry, and that people forget to um, consider and take I look into it. So first of all, what I'll do is I'll jump back to the slides, um, back to the demo. And um, what I'll do is I'll just clean this, um, my environment. And what I'll do next is I'll just create a, again, a data set. Um, and we'll go and see what happens if your data is not normalized. So in this case, I'm taking, again, weight in kilograms um, and just made up an example, um, and then height in inches and centimeters. Um, those are literally the same translated from inches to centimeters, um, but as you can see, 66 inches equals to um, 167 centimeters those two different numbers can express in different covariances when um, correlated to when, when introduced with weight in kilograms. So in this case, I'll create two different data sets and I will calculate k-means. Okay, and then what I will do is I'll just give you a quick example how the data are those um, different um, perspective of inches and kilograms um, has an effect on um, clustering. So on the left hand side, you see that I've deliberately just chosen chosen two clusters. Um, you can see the clusters where I have kilograms and centimeters. On the right hand side, you see that I have um, kilograms and inches. And now if I take a look where the, let's let's focus on uh, observation number three, in this case here, which goes to cluster number two, and observation number three, which in this case goes to cluster number one. So this is again something which can cause and have an effect um, on different behavior of the data sets um, when doing distance-based algorithms. 
um, based on that you will have a different results um, as you would have had without or with data normalization. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to create um, the, the similarity matrix and I'll do hierarchical clustering and again you will see that I have inches on the right hand side and centimeters on the left hand side and you can see even here I can have let's say on the left hand side two or three clusters so in first cluster observation number four and eight goes together second cluster observation number three and six and then the rest of the four variables or observations or observations will go into one cluster if i take it into consideration inches i can immediately see that number eight observation number eight is in its own cluster which is definitely a strange behavior because i'm getting it when compared to clusters using centimeters, centimeters is in the same cluster as the observation number four. And then comparison with one and seven, they both go together, but are in the separate cluster here. If I cut here, for instance, or here, they are in separate cluster, whereas um, in case of centimeters, I have all four in the same cluster. So this is again something which is visually showing you that something is literally wrong even though I have the same data set which is a sample fake data set um, but data is behaving absolutely differently because of me let's say forgetting about normalization. I can also check and compare the means and you can see that mean for those um, distance-based um, the, the similarity matrices are different because of not normalizing and I will also compare the matrix using k-mean and you can see I'll just quickly do this you can see that um, using centimeters I get those numbers versus between us in inches I get this number so those are somehow off sorry this one this one and this one uh, are somehow off so what i'll do next is i'll use the normalization i will do a simple normalization which means observation minus mean divided by standard deviation so no literally no huge math here going on i'll just place through that and what i'll do is i'll create again the k-means and I will clear here so you can see it much better now. Now you can see that betweenness of both clusters once the data is being normalized are literally the same. So second um, decimal, you know, there's some changes. And within this, um, using centimeters and inches, you can see that both numbers are also the same with some minor differences. So this one is the same as this one and this one is the same as this one. So keep in mind that normalization will definitely reduce the covariances but will not give you any additional effect of losing or um, correlation or non-correlation. So this is again something which needs to be taken into consideration. And then again, um, do always do we always need the data to be and to have them correlated? First of all, I'm going to clean my environment to give you next demo. <clears throat> so in this case, what I'll do is I'll just have a couple of examples created. So I'm taking Iris data set, which is something that comes um, pre prepared for you. So I'm using a uh, density um, matrices and um, area on the curve. And in this case, I'll just leave our engine to do everything. Um, I'll leave it to engine to plot everything out and then I'll come to the interpretation. I'll just clean this. So this is the case. Um, as you can see, I'm just taking two variables, 
Um, so I'm predicting in this case iris data set and I'm predicting um, I'm predicting um, the species and I'm taking the rest of the five um, into consideration. So the sepal length width and the petal le le length and width. And I'm trying to predict the um, whether it is a serotosa or not. So in this case, you can see that um, my data set is being highly correlated. As you can see, the density plot for both variables is literally the same. This will definitely have a huge, huge impact on the AOC, which will be then my prediction, or it will tell me how good my model is predicting. Um, as you can see, um, if two variables are highly correlated, then this will happen to my prediction. In the next case, what I'm doing is I'm having um, the same formula, the same data set, but those numbers are not correlating. As you can see, the density plot for both are just in this case are slightly, let's say, correlating. This at the end will give me much better and much higher end result in terms of area on the curve. As you can see that I will have a um, much better um, true positive rate um, versus true uh, false positive rate. Um, so depicting that um, it is not um, for some algorithms important. Um, it is mandatory that data set and variables, input variables are not correlating with each other versus um, some cases where it is very much important that data sets are correlating. So factor analysis, for instance, um, is a case where you definitely need to have um, all the input variables, at least 0 0.3 correlation is required. Um, and there are also some other assumptions for the factor analysis. But in this case, I will just go back to the slides because um, I think we have time on our hand to deal with. So um, modeling and predicting um, things we likely to forget about is training the model, um, why we use train, um, test, validate data sets is just to have model not being over or underfeeded. Um, regularization of the weights is also something very important because uh, we don't want to have um, data um, being over or underfeeded. Um, parameter sweeping or hyper tuning um, really depends on the how we want to call it but um, there is there are companies that literally have data scientists just dealing with this problem and don't and I've seen also many times that people just um, define you know a couple of those input parameters and that's it so please don't do that um, take time to find the correct um, tuning of those parameters. Um, there is a nice feature if you're using Azure Machine Learning um, called parameter sweeping, which just literally, it is a black box, but then um, you just put in the data and let it go and run through all the tuning itself and find the best um, values for those um, parameters. Um, and also having to know what is the difference between false positive, um, false negative, or what is the difference between accuracy or loss function, or just literally Pearson correlation coefficients versus loss function, or me MSE, mean square error versus loss function. Those are very important metrics, but some of them will tell you definitely different things than the other one. And also um, not forget about validation because validation of the data set. There are different types of validation, which will definitely have a huge impact if you either forget those or ignore those. Um, I will skip the demo for that part and just go on since we only have 15 more minutes. Um, visualization things um, we don't want. <laughs> um, visualization is, as um, introduced at the beginning, is also very important because um, 
um, usually a picture will tell more than 100 words. So um, that's why it is very important to have the right visualization um, and not doing it with the wrong charts or visualizing the wrong data um, and creating um, way too much tables or way too much graphs or something like that. And also um, what is useful and what is beautiful. So I'll just go and dig into those visualization part. I've seen many times having something like this, gender and some type of question. And if the first one, um, if the first pie chart wasn't good enough, then I've also seen people doing some additional fancy schmancy um, visualization, giving you a sort of like a much better and nicer view, but in reality, both are literally the same and in fact, very useless. The second thing is the sneaky grand totals. Um, pie charts are by self quite sneaky because they will give you effect of having 100% since it's a circle. But in reality, the case depicts that 109% um, is sort of <laughs> depicted on the graph. And this is something that um, inadvertently will um, sway and give you a wrong um, perception of your data. And this is also something that I don't understand, you know, this rainbow charts with, again, pie chart, <laughs> um, with way too much um, items on the graph and way too much colorization on the graph because of um, somebody not taking care and either grouping the data sets together or something like that. Again, something that I don't and can imagine is something like that, where you have like two or three type of gas um, presenting um, presenting 80, 90% of all, and then you have three, which is less than 1%. In this case, is it, is it really good to have it depicted like this, what you can do, you can either remove them or show them in different type of graph or visually in different type of chart. Ignoring scales is also something that I've seen many times people forget about, you know, syncing both KPI 1 and KPI 2 and you will see that um, the values um, are looks the same, but then once you see the scale, so the scale on the left-hand side graph is from 0 to 20, on the right-hand side is from 0 to 40, and you can see that this is then literally a huge difference. And also those pie charts above, those colorization, this is absolutely hard to read for, for human brain. <laughs> and what this should look like is literally something like this. So once the scales are sort of normalized or equalized, then you can see that this is the huge difference between any kind of color if you compare it from KPI 1 to KPI 2. Another thing that I've also seen is that um, you have six different variables and those six variables have you know values from one to five and I've seen people doing something like this with the line chart. Line chart is reserved for maximum two let's say three um, values or variables and six is definitely a little bit too crowded or over complicated and something else that I've also seen <laughs> this is those geeky graphs or that looks like you know playing Minecraft on the left hand side and also those old school bar graphs 3D bar graphs giving you absolutely insane um, 3 depth 3D depth effect but it's definitely hard to read um, and also as we've spoken with um, dealing with outliers, um, sometimes outliers can be um, quite nifty. Um, so there is a good solution if you're using Excel, those are um, links to that solution. You can easily cut or create a broken column or bar chart in order to visualize um, the rest of those five series versus 
the fourth one which is sort of an outlier and this will definitely have much greater and much better effect on the reader or somebody for whom you're either writing a report if you're considering what type of data i am visualizing there is a very nice and beautiful website data viz catalog where you can just compare the different data types of visualization if you're into that and this is something which is also important just understanding what type of um, charts are useful for representing what kind of problem um, rules that i follow in terms of visualization um, we visualize data literally to make them more understandable and not vice versa we are not creating visualization to have the data you know abbreviated until the end so it's hard to read or it is incomprehensible um, my rule of thumb is uh, if you don't understand it next date don't expect your client will um, some of the data are better told with plain numbers and I have a beautiful example of that um, coming up um, keep it simple fancy does not always mean better and of course defaults are obvious what I mean with that is this i've seen a lot of excel charts with default numbers with default backgrounds with default data types and everything those are obvious and if you go back to excel 2000 you will immediately recognize this one and with the last excel this one not that i'm saying anything's wrong with excel it might be r it might be python but just invest a couple of more minutes um, into those finding the right solution I'll quickly jump to my main um, reporting services. So I have here a prediction model. And I said that sometimes numbers can also be represented very good. So this is a case of text prediction classification model where I've created a couple of different um, models. And you can see the accuracy of those models um, and the time they were created and some names. And sometimes, as I said, numbers can be good enough without, you know, over exaggerating with graphs or something. So accuracy will definitely give me 66% or 70%. I will immediately know which model is performing better than the other one. Um, talking about predictions, um, how to do that, um, if I go to my um, SQL server, um, this is something that was created using in database machine learning um, with Python. So what I did was, first of all, I've created a prediction that literally takes the input data set, creates a size, telling me what size of the test data I want to have, and then um, store the data set into the model. So once I have those models, um, in the database, I can run this and you can see that these are, for instance, my models um, that I can store in the database and later reuse them and read either the accuracy or how good the model is performing and, and so on and so forth. And then if I want to predict on a model, I'll go back to my reporting services. This is my model. If I want to predict on a model and see which model is performing better based on the test sample. I can just create a model, uh, sorry, select a model, take some age, take the distance, and then run the predictions itself. So this is created using Python and um, in database machine learning services. And in the back, it is literally just reading the data, the model from the table and then um, pickling the model and creating the predictions. So going back to the slides, um, to wrap up, um, we still have 10 more minutes, great. Um, learn from mistakes. So um, don't ever, you know, judge yourself saying, oh, this model is not good, I've failed or something. Mistakes are, you know, good, but learn from them. Um, rethink the business problem and the business model. At the end, it is always a good um, or best good or best practice to go back 
to your original draft and see what is um, your problem, what was the, the client wanted, and rethink if everything was set correctly. Um, be positive before you hand out either the report or deploy the model if you can really um, agree on that report or if you can really stand behind that model. This literally means that um, deploying something into production and if you're a data scientist you need to take accountability for that model saying that the predictions will be fine or if you're handing out the report go through those numbers again and again and again and always ask yourself at the end is there something that i am missing is there a point that i forget about always do that and have your you know coding partner or data science partner you know reread proofread or go through the numbers with you again and in the code and the report as well so this is from my side everything um, back to you christian um the question panel is open 10 minutes left yes uh, thanks thomas it, it was a very good presentation and it joined us uh, a lot um we haven't had any questions yet so um there's yeah uh, there's none to ask <laughs> Okay, so um, we still have five minutes left. Um, yeah. I can go through some code or we can wrap it up. Um, yeah, it, <clears throat> it's up to you if you have anything additional. Um, now is your time. I have, I have a lot of demos, but so let's just um, call it a night since it's the morning and um, <laughs> no worries. Um, so let's go. Yes. Oh, yes. So um, for those of you who are still here, uh, stay tuned for our next session, uh, Beyond IoT Real-Time Data Ingestion with the Asia Stream Analytics. And it's uh, presented by Paul Andrew. So. Yeah, and thank you for attending. It, uh... All right, Thomas. Before we discussion, we have another one last question. How many? Uh, I saw many bad examples with I charts. Do you have any recommendations in charts versus the purpose of the data? So, um, can you can you repeat the question? Sorry, I'm I'm having hard time. Sure. Um, question from Leonardo Bravo. Uh, it says, he's asking, I saw many bad examples with high charts. Do you have any recommendation in chart versus purpose of the data? Okay, so the question was, I've seen um, if you have any suggestions for the pie chart and when not to use and when to use them, was that correct? Okay, so yes. I'm having audio problem. So uh, yeah, the, the general um, rule for the pie chart is um, if you have more than four or five values, then just skip the pie chart. I personally don't like pie charts and I would definitely not recommend you using them. Um, um, they are nice, but they are um, phys <laughs> physically, psychologically hard to read because we better understand the numbers if they are represented either in bars or in lines um, because you know um, imagine a pie chart which is sort of like a part of a circle and it's hard to understand that in percentage or compare it to the other slices of those pie charts so um, i would definitely recommend you if you're willing and starting to use pie charts just have those pie charts minimized have them simplified have either the numbers with the percentage for the reader or for the um, in the report for the um, end user easier to understand um, but otherwise just um, replace the pie charts with pie chart with by chart sorry bar charts or line charts or anything else or you might as well just um, drop the whole pie chart and just keep the data in um, the percentage in a table 
that's from my side.